Hello everyone, this is Dr. Bob Browner with uh, Community Coronavirus Update number 39. I'll run through the numbers again that then focused on our uh, testing problems and the political will, con will to control this pandemic and the concept of silver buckshot versus a silver bullet. So uh, basically what we're still seeing, of course, is that the outbreaks are worst in the middle of America right now, uh, especially the northern side, but also a little bit down here. That's kind of harder to see on the state by state view. Uh, but if you look at the county level view, you can see that most of the red is in middle and rural America. Uh, the Northeast learned their lesson uh, months ago, and then uh, then Arizona, Flor uh, you know, Southern Florida and California had to learn their lessons. Now it's taking the middle of the country has to learn their lessons about what not to do in a pandemic. Uh, if you want to look at some scale, uh, one thing to look at is how bad did the pandemics get. You know, this is basically New York and New Jersey at the first round. The second round, it was Arizona and Florida, uh, Texas that learned the hard way. Uh, now it's North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa. Hopefully, there uh, looks like there is some downward trend already. So hopefully, they won't have to learn uh, the lesson quite as hardly as everybody else. Uh, and so uh, hopefully, people are, are starting to behave the way they need to within a pandemic. But right now, the, the big problems are rural America and college towns. So if you look at Nebraska, uh, the levels, you know, it looks like mostly northeast Nebraska and the middle of Nebraska is where numbers are worst. Uh, you have to be a little careful uh, looking at county by county numbers because it really only takes, you know, one wedding or one uh, volleyball team to make a whole county turn red because the population base is pretty small. So it's a little hard to interpret those numbers. Uh, that's why on our public tableau site, if you go to healthynebraska.org, you can combine counties. So if you live in Norfolk, Nebraska, you can click on all the county, counties that surround you. So you could add Madison, Pierce, Stanton, and Wayne counties together. Makes it a little easier to interpret, but it's still a little confusing when you've got numbers that small, unfortunately. Uh, here in Lancaster County, where I live in Lincoln, uh, college town, of course, we had our meat processing outbreak overflowing from Crete. We had the premature opening this summer where the governor told everybody to rush back to restaurants and bars with no mask ordinance in place. We put our mask ordinance in place, got our numbers down, and then it was the return of the college kids who uh, basically haven't been following our direct, their directions like they're supposed to, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, hope the good news is it appears that most of these appear to be staying within the colleges, not spreading out to the rest of the community or to our K through 12 schools. So Lincoln Public Schools, we've been back in session for uh, you know three plus weeks now, uh, still have not had any within school spread, which is great to hear. Uh, we were worried about that, but so far uh, things are doing looking pretty good, which means that the masking and everything else in place is probably working. Um, uh, Kearney in Buffalo County where the University of Nebraska Kearney is looks like they had some of their social outbreaks plus potentially a college return here. Uh, hopefully they will also get things under control there. Omaha, Douglas Sarpy County, maybe Creighton and UNO aren't enough to throw off their population base or maybe the Creighton and UNO, UNO kids behave better. They also put in a mask ordinance and so you see their cases dropping again. So we'll get to the big problem that uh, I want to talk about today. And one is the problems around testing. And so our big biggest problem, which Atul Gawande goes into in this uh, New Yorker article, is we still have no organized approach. And that's that's been our problem. Other countries put an organized approach in place. We did not. Uh, it has a, the, a, a couple reasons. Number one is, frankly, we just didn't have any political will or leadership at either the state or national level to put this in place. Uh, the second issue they talk about is, frankly, our healthcare system is designed to compete with each other, not work together. So most hospital systems focus on on uh, basically focusing on market share and competition, not banding together to improve the health of the community. And so nobody, unfortunately, is working together to get an organized approach to testing. And it's not gonna happen without political leadership. And so basically we could get under the control if we had the political leadership and the political will to get there. Uh, so some examples here locally, here in Lincoln, Lancaster County, one great thing in our our county dashboard is we actually have put test turnaround time in place and so we can see how our labs doing uh, the metric we should have is really you want test results in, le in less than 24 to 48 hours and only one lab actually is even close to that so if P lab stands for physician lab that's the lab that, that uh, small independent clinics use so their turnaround time is actually pretty good uh, lab core is actually another lab that is used by both Brian health and some small and some of the independent clinics so they're the only ones that are even close test Nebraska which is supposed to be our flagship testing for the state is still at three and a half days turnaround time and it's actually worse because of the communication issues so the effective turnaround time for test nebraska is now four to seven days uh, until we can get these uh, our turnaround time in less than 24 to 48 hours this is really hampering our epidemic our chances at getting this epidemic under control and so what we need is better public accountability, which is one of the things that uh, Atul Gawande talked about. It's also something that Ali Khan at the College of Public Health, our dean of uh, the College of Public Health is working on. Uh, one, we need test turnaround time so that we can get people identified. And then the contact tracing, we need time to contact tracing and percentage of cases isolated also posted on these dashboards. Uh, because that's what you have to do to get in uh, control of the pandemic. You have to find out who's infectious, identify them as soon as possible, and then get them isolated. If you don't do that, it's going to keep spreading. And so we do have a number of 
state dashboards, and I've got the link uh, on the on the notes section again if you want to look at some of these uh, state dashboards and local county level dashboards, for example. But one thing we need to add to all the dashboards is test turnaround time and time to contact tracing and time to isolation. Uh, and there's a lot of confusion still around isolation. So one example is, is the concept of isolation time and having to wa wait 14 days. So a lot of people seem to be confused about that. So a person uh, I saw basically said was frustrated because they couldn't get a test right away so they could go back to work. Actually, regardless of the results of your test, that doesn't mean you can go back to work. So if you were contacted or had a significant contact with someone who might have been infectious on day zero and you rush out and get a test on day two and it's negative, it does not mean you can go back to work. And the reason is that the incubation phase for this virus is slow. It can take us, uh, it takes on average average five days but as long as 14 days so no matter what your test shows anywhere between here and here you can't go back to work to day 14 because when you got exposed here you may not develop infection till day 12 so if you got a test here that's negative that does not give you the all clear to go back to work now the response of course is wait I, I I need to work, I need to put food on the table. Well, unfortunately, other countries did put a, a stipend in place. So in Sweden, for example, if you are in isolation, you get paid uh, to stay home so that you can still afford food and put food on the table. In the, in the United States, we have no social safety net like that. And so people are basically put in a tough decision. If they're uh, financially on edge and can't put food on the table, they're sort of incentivized to go back to work, unfortunately, which might spread it to other people. Now, once you're positive, you don't have to wait 14 days because you, once you're positive, you actually know that you've already completed the incubation phase. But depending on, on how you do it, you may have another 10 days though before you, have to, you can go back to work. And so we need to get people to understand that rushing out and getting a test here doesn't mean you're good to go. In an ideal world, we'd have adequate testing so that you could get testing here and maybe here and maybe here uh, just to to make sure you know when you're getting infected but because our testing is so uh, still not available widely you may want to wait uh, till for five to seven days before you first get a test so a relative of mine had a potential infection because uh, exposure because it was a wedding he waited till day nine to get tested because he wanted to make sure that that you know there was enough time for him to see if he was okay so rushing out and getting a test right away is not the right solution it is the right solution to identify contacts as soon as possible but it doesn't mean you're in the clear so what we need is better testing. We need this on, on all of our state dashboards and we need better turnaround time so we can get under control of this pandemic. Uh, another, last thing I want to talk about the concept of a silver bullet versus silver buckshot. And so we have silver buckshot and it works. So let's quit focusing on the silver bullet. Uh, a vaccine is likely three to six months away still. And so despite the politics of this, people want to know, uh, you know, act like this is going to happen as soon as possible it's not going to happen and so before you can put out a vaccine safely it has to go through several phases of trials because we need to make sure the vaccine doesn't cause any harm and so all uh, legit vaccines like influenza measles mumps and rubella vaccines hpv vaccines they've been through these trials to make sure that they're absolutely safe we don't want to repeat the mistakes of history where there have been uh, vaccines released prematurely that didn't, ended up causing more harm than good and so SARS-CoV vaccines are in phase one, two, and three trials right now. So phase one to two trials, this is a small scale trial. Just phase one is to make sure, give it to a few healthy volunteers and make sure it doesn't cause them to get sick. Next, then you make sure that the vaccine actually causes the immune response measured by antibody testing, for example, to make sure it looks like it's going to work. Then you move on to phase three, which is where a lot of trials are in, including Nebraska, but those involve tens of thousands of people because some side effects are very rare. And if they're only happening one out of 10,000 people, you need to test probably 20, 30,000 to discover such a side effect. Uh, you may have seen the announcement where one vaccine trial was hard to, uh, halted because someone got sick. Now I have to make sure it may not be the vaccine, it may be something else, but you have to be careful in this stage. And that's why we're probably three to six months away from a widely available vaccine because of the safety things that need to be in place before you release the vaccine prematurely. Uh, if you want to hear more detail on it, there's two really great podcasts. Uh, this one, uh, uh, Johns Hopkins Public Health on Call, number 152 from Josh Sharfstein. He's a former acting FDA administrator. He talks about the politics and what really needs to be done to make sure this is safe. Uh, there's a longer version, the SIDRAP uh, podcasts from the University of Minnesota, uh, Dr. Osterholm. These are really good. Uh, they're longer though. They're about an hour long, but still a very good uh, uh, overview. So if you really want to understand this well, uh, go listen to the, either of these podcasts, and I've linked to those in the notes section. Um, so, you know, what can you do? Well, one, don't do bad things. These are bad things to do in a pandemic. Don't go to a Sturgis rally and, and hang out in a bar like this. Uh, I'm not sure if 250,000 coronavirus cases might be an overestimate, but it might be true. This may have been, this may be a super spreading event for the history backs. Uh, don't go watch a volleyball game and not wear a mask like this uh, group here. And certainly don't go to this party. So this was actually, this is actually a party in, in uh, downtown Lincoln. Unfortunately, this should never have happened. Uh, luckily, UNL is now starting to take things a little more seriously. They suspended 
six Greece houses for not following uh, guidelines and hopefully this will get uh, some of our college outbreaks uh, tamped down uh, hopefully we this uh, if we can get rural folks to start wearing masks when they're at a volleyball game like this we can get those epidemics tamped down uh, and so again, you know, it, we, we know what, what causes outbreaks. And so here's a good, another good example of contact tracing where a Starbucks in South Korea, one person in a Starbucks infected 27 other people. And so unfortunately, it's just not safe yet uh, with this level of community spread to be going to coffee shops, bars, and restaurants without a mask. And so just go outside. So what can you do? Uh, well, one, focus on silver buckshot. Silver buckshot means there's not one thing, there's a lot of little things that work. Number one is wear a mask. Uh, this is me going to the barber shop, uh, and then Barbara and I wearing masks. We've got numerous examples. There was one case where two people were infected, served 140 customers, not a single one infected because people were wearing masks. Outside's better than in, keep your distance, wash your hands, and keep to smaller gatherings. If we do this, we can actually control the pandemic regardless of how good or bad our government does. So we as individuals can control the epidemic just by doing things like this. Uh, get out and do things that are fun doesn't mean you can't get out and have fun so you know these are the winery things that we go to this is my father and my father-in-law we're spaced we're six feet apart and in situations like this you don't need a mask we're well spaced out uh, go support your restaurants restaurants and bars have really taken a hit but a lot of them are trying to do the right thing we went on a road trip this weekend out uh, southern Colorado uh, went hiking on the dunes and some other things uh, but we look for remote restaurants and, and coffee shops and places where you can sit outside safely like this support those folks they've t probably taken the biggest hit, uh, hit with the pandemic economically so support those restaurants and, and bars and coffee shops that are doing the right thing and creating a safe environment for you like this. Uh, and lastly, masks are safe. I don't know why people keep focusing on why people can't wear a mask. You can wear a mask. Uh, in Lincoln Public Schools, I think we had less than 1% who qualified for an exemption. Uh, it was actually a fraction of a percent, but even a lot of those who actually could potentially not have to wear a mask, many are just choosing to wear a mask because actually the mask is perfectly safe for most people. An example I would use, we went biking uh, two weeks ago, it was a little dusty on the trail. So one of the people uh, I was biking with pulled out her mask and she rode all the way back from Cortland with a mask. If a woman in her fifties can ride back from Cortland, Nebraska in the heat and the mask, a young healthy person can wear a mask while playing volleyball. And here's uh, from the newspaper this morning, a uh, pious gal playing uh, volleyball with a mask, you're fine. So I wish people would just get over these mask issues. Masks are perfectly safe. Uh, so many uh, professionals wear, wear masks their entire careers. It's not a problem unless it's just really hot outside and even then you can usually do fine and drink more water. So hopefully this is all helpful to you. This is what I do for a living. Disclaimer that this is my opinion, not necessarily of everybody here, but this is again to verify that I'm where I work and that I'm not just some crazy YouTube guy. So hopefully this is helpful to you.